So that's where we're going to be, John chapter 15. And um, we're going to keep on with this whole scenario that Jesus is paying for us with the idea of um, the Christian life being like a vineyard. You know? With God the Father as um, the gardener or the vine dresser or whatever it is you want to call him. Um, and Jesus himself is the main vine. And then we are these branches that produce the grapes. And so he comes in and he paints this picture for it, for us, um, because this is something he uh, he set up for uh, his disciples to hear. This wasn't a uh, a broad, sweeping sermon on the mount type situation where you got hundreds, if not thousands, of people listening. This is his intimate friends. These are the people who've been traveling with him for three and a half years, and. and uh, we're down one now because Judas has left the room to go betray Jesus. So he's going to get the high priest while Jesus is saying these words. But again, because this is kind of the last discourse that Jesus has with his disciples, it really tends to, uh, to lend extra weight to what's going on. Um, what Jesus is saying are words that are absolutely vital to us. Um, I'm a firm believer that you can, that any truth you see in the New Testament, you can find an Old Testament example, if not just plain, plainly stating what the New Testament is repeating. Um, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God of the Old Testament is still the same God in the New Testament. He didn't change. Um, because of the nature of what Jesus did on the cross for us, it enabled him to change a little bit of the way he dealt with us. Um, he was able far more to pour out his grace and his Holy Spirit on us in ways that he couldn't really do in Old Testament days. But everything that was true then is still true today. And so the truths that we see here isn't anything revolutionary. It's not a shocking revelation, or at least I guess I should say it shouldn't be. Because honestly, when you got, you know, all the books of the Old Testament, the entire five books of the law and all the prophets that came afterwards, you got enough to be able to figure it out. But part of the problem is that people weren't doing a good job of figuring it out. Um, the people who had the loudest voice, the, the scribes, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those type of people, the, the high priests, they had a, a set way of, of what the scripture meant. And, and they weren't prone towards new ideas or perhaps old ideas even. Um, they had their own set way and they were going to stick to it come hell or high water. Um, and Jesus came in, and he starts explaining things in a way that had never been done before. And so light bulbs start coming on for all the people because Jesus wasn't like a normal preacher. Like, guys, if I'm, if I'm lucky, we're going to get this thing done in about – like 20 to maybe probably more like 30 minutes, maybe even over. Come on, maybe I ought to get my phone out so I can keep track of time. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, finished one of the most powerful sermons in literally less than 10 minutes, probably honestly less than five minutes. You guys aren't that lucky. I'm not that good. And so... Jesus came in and uh, he starts explaining things in a way that people have never really heard before. It's Again, it's not that he was saying anything new. <laughs> it's that he was explaining it in a way that really connected with people. It made a lot more sense than what they were going to the synagogue and hearing on Saturdays, because that's when you went to synagogue, it was on Saturdays. Uh, and so Jesus comes in and he's teaching in a new and fresh way. He's drawing up illustrations because 
let's face it, we all like those. It, it just helps us really connect it if we can understand a visual picture of what's going on. So Jesus does that. And I, I wanted to go ahead and read John chapter 15. I'm doing the first three verses of this. It says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. And I wanted to kind of dwell there in verse 3 today. Um, so Jesus lays out this illustration that we're just a bunch of branches that Part of what we're supposed to do is produce fruit. Now, you can go to the book of Galatians and, and read what the fruits of the Spirit is, you know, joy, peace, uh, love, self-control, all that and more. Um, there's nine of them. I've never took the time to memorize them. Um, but that sort of thing that they're supposed to, that the world is supposed to be seeing in us. And so he comes in. And he starts explaining that we're supposed to bear fruit. But what I love about this chapter in general, especially you get into verses four and five, is that he explains all this fruit. You can't do it without his help. You can't. You simply cannot. It is impossible. And so what we've done in church is we kind of took up, generally speaking, um because there are definitely churches that are an exception but we've taken up kind of the mantle of the pharisees and we started saying you need to do this and you need to make sure you don't do this and we build up this this huge checklist of things that you're supposed to do and you're not supposed to do and, and while all that is, is true it loses the heart of what god has been trying to tell us this whole time is that without him we can't like he gives us this, this statement where he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And, and to begin with, for most of my life, I read that as almost a manipulative statement. Because that's kind of what it felt like to me. And um, that's not the way he meant it at all. At all. And, and so... When God showed me that, it, it wasn't meant to be manipulative. What it was meant to be is a promise. Is that when you love him, you'll obey his commandments. And it just, it just one follows the other. If A, then B happens. It, it's that simple. If you love him, you're going to obey his commandments. And so that raises the question, okay, if I love them, I'll just automatically start doing all these things I've been getting told in church that I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm not doing very well if I'm doing them at all. Um, so how then do I get to love Jesus? How do I get to love him? I mean, I feel like I kind of do, but obviously um, if, if I genuinely love him, I'm going to obey him. Maybe I don't love him quite as much as I should. Yeah. And so that's what this whole thing is about. Jesus is drawing a picture to help us to live life in a relationship with him. Because what happens is that we kind of do this just the way we were raised. Is that for most of us, we go to church on Sunday. And, you know, back in my day, we had Sunday school before church. And then we had, you know, church. And then we would go home, and maybe maybe we'd go eat with somebody afterwards, <laughs> and come come back on Wednesday night, and all that was wonderful. But you know what you did Monday, Tuesday, most of Wednesday, and frankly, honestly, most of Sunday too. Come right now, you only give a couple hours to God on Sunday morning. Um, but Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that's pretty much your business, and so long as you're not murdering somebody or having adulterous affairs all over the place. You're probably okay, right? That's kind of the way we were raised. Um, and, and it's not like our parents were trying to teach us that. 
That's not the lesson they hoped for us to pick up. So I, honestly, as kids, more is caught than taught. We can say one thing and then go and live another way. And guess what our kids are generally going to do? They're, they're going to fall right in our footprints. We laid a trail for them to follow, whether we realized it or not. And so what it takes is for us as parents, as, as believers these days, is to blaze a new trail. Uh, because it's not just about going through the motions. It's not about giving God a couple hours on Sunday, maybe an hour on Wednesday. It, it doesn't look like that. It, it's it's not even about, okay, God, I've got 15 minutes in the morning, or maybe even an hour. Maybe you're, like, really good, and you got to give them an hour in the morning, okay? And then the rest of the day is mine. <laughs> or, or maybe it's, like, an hour in the morning, and um, then I prayed over on my lunch. I was really good. I was at work. I bowed my head in front of all my coworkers. They looked at me funny, but I don't care. I prayed over my lunch, and then at dinner with my family, we sat down, we held hands, we prayed over the food, and um, then before bedtime, we even we prayed again, and maybe we even did a Bible study or something like that. And, and that's good, and that's that's all wonderful. I'm not trying to say don't do that. But what it is is I found that that's fitting God into the cracks. And maybe you're making a crack for him to fit into it. Maybe a nice wide crack for him to fit into it. But that's not what he's looking for. He's not looking for that at all. And so he draws this whole illustration, and I want to just kind of just read this out to you and let you know that there's so much more that he has for us. So I'm going to back up. I'm starting in verse 1 again. He says, I am the true <laughs> grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. <clears throat> love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There's no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever, whatever you ask for using my name. And this is my claim. Love <coughs> each other. As far as I'm going this. But he's just drawing this beautiful illustration that, hey, God isn't meant to just fit in the cracks. Jesus isn't something for Sunday mornings or even three times a day. Or heck, even 20 times a day. He's for every moment. That's what he's trying to let us know is that we don't have to fit God in the cracks. He will do that if that's all we're willing to do. He will fit in there and he will take that and he will produce some fruit in your life. But if you want real fruit, if you want to live a life that has eternal effect, the older I get, the more important this idea of legacy becomes. And I know it's just going to get more and more so. And the simple fact is that most of us are not going to do much to be remembered beyond a couple of generations. After we pass away, 
you know, my great, great, great grandkids are probably not going to have a clue who I was, what I stood for, what I cared about, what I don't care about. Hey, I disagree. You, you disagree. Love <laughs> oh, you're all about that. <laughs> Point is that if <clears throat> if we're producing fruit that Jesus is talking about here, you know what? It's eternal. It lasts forever. There is no cap. Why? Because we last forever. And the things that we're doing are built into eternity. It's investing into eternal things. And you know what? There, there are two eternal things in this world. There's people and there's God's word. Those two things last forever. So we pour ourselves into the things that matter. <clears throat> no, my great, great, great grandkids are not going to know who I am. But you know what? We're told again and again in the Bible, when I pour myself into eternal things, and I pour eternal concepts of God into my kids, they're probably going to turn around and pour that into their kids. And they're probably <laughs> going to turn around and pour that into their kids. My great, great, great grandkids may not know who I am, but they're going to know who Jesus is because of the things that I'm pouring into my kids. And that's what he wants for all of us. A life that isn't just a matter of fitting him in the craft, but a life that just absolutely breathes him in every moment and breathes him out. That's what he's wanting. And how do we get there? digs in here in, in verse 3, gives us one little snippet that really kind of gives us a very powerful um, concept. He says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I'm giving you. Now, I don't know about you guys, because some versions will even say, um, let's see, you've already been cleaned and purified by the message I've given you, by the word I've given you. This is what God's word does to us and for us, is it cleans us up. Because what I've found is that when I read this thing, and I'm not just, you know, it's not just a checklist thing. It's not to break it open, okay, I'm in Second Chronicles today, chapter 5, and so Solomon finished all his work on the temple of the Lord. Got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, okay, I hit my deed. <laughs> and it doesn't make a difference. That's not the way we're supposed to take it in. If this is God's word, we take it seriously because we take it seriously. I mean, honestly, if, if there's somebody that we really adore, if we really love that person, if if Kennedy walks up to dear Wendy and, and says, mom, 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 and, you know, the hundred times that, kids are prone at that age are prone to doing because if you don't give them your immediate attention they keep saying mom right um that's just what they do they want our, our attention and it's the same thing god is here for us and we're like these kids to him and he wants us to love him in such a way that we're constantly going to him and say hey father Check this out. This is what happened to me today. And yeah, he already knows. He was right there when it happened. But he still wants to hear us. He wants to hear our take on it. He, he enjoys <clears throat> our enjoyment of life. And he hurts with us. But life hurts us. And he wants to share that with us every moment <clears throat> of the day. And so the only secret I've found is that we, we turn that internal dialogue, all, all those words that go on in our heads, we turn that to him. And it becomes suddenly that command that he gave us to pray without ceasing, it becomes possible. Suddenly, it's, it's not just me talking to myself, I'm talking to God. You can ask my kids, I talk to myself all the time. Uh, <laughs> It's definitely doable, but when we dig in to his word, it changes us. That's what I found. That's what he's talking about here in verse 3 when he says that. He, he says, you've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. When he gives us a message, 
when we break open that Bible and we read it in such a way that we're trying to get God out of it, it changes us. Sometimes in, in, in unexpected and miraculous <laughs> ways. There's, there's people I have known and I've seen God's word change them time and time again. And they're in this process. They're growing up to be more and more like him. And it's a beautiful thing. And it's so exciting to watch. I, I love seeing it. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Is that he gives us a message, we take it, and we say, okay, what do I do with this? Because if you don't ask that when you're done reading your Bible, what did I just read and what do I do with it? You're missing out. And, and it's not about getting another commandment for God to, to tell you, okay, if you don't do this, you're in trouble. It, it's not like that. It, it, it's what does this commandment, if God's giving you a commandment right here, what's this tell me about who he is? If he says something mm -hmm. as simple as, thou shalt not kill, what, what does that tell us about him? It tells us that he treasures people. I mean, we see back in Genesis when he created them, man and woman, he created each of them in the image of God. And so when we murder, we're not just committing murder against that person and hurting the family of that person and the ones who love of that person. We're hurting God himself because what we've done is we, we've damaged his image here on earth. So even something as simple as thou shalt not kill, it tells us something about who he is, <clears throat> not just what to do, or in this case, not to do. It tells us something about him. And so we start to see how God weaves himself through all of life. And that's what he's talking about here. When he's saying abide in me, that's what he's meaning. It, it, that he fits in every piece of life. When he says, remain in me, he's not just whistling Dixie. It's something we can absolutely do. <clears throat> Question is, do we care enough to do it? Do we care enough that when we open the Bible, we don't just go through the motions? I mean, I get it. I mean, there have been countless times in my life when I've broken open the Bible and I've read it and I'm just like, there's a hundred different reasons. Maybe I'm distracted. Maybe I, I, I'm sleepy. Maybe I, I'm just stressed from whatever else. I, there's a <clears> hundred <throat> reasons why we can break open the Bible and not get anything done. It happens all the time for me. But what I've found is if I just stop, before I get in and I just go to God and I say, okay, God, I'm here for you. I, I, I'm not here to just read something. I'm here to know more about you, to learn who you are and to fall more in love with you. So God, help me today, right here, right now to do that. And you go in and start reading it in a new and fresh way. And maybe you've got to read that one verse 18 times in order to understand what it meant. Just to get something out of it. It's worth it. I mean, because otherwise you're just wasting your time, right? I don't know about you guys, but I don't like wasting my time. If I'm going to waste it, I'm going to waste it in times I enjoy. In ways that I enjoy. <laughs> just there's such riches and, and we just if God is the goal that's underneath the surface so many of us most of the time we settle for raking leaves on top and we call that good and it's never meant to be that way you go back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and even the first part of chapter 3 you see this beautiful relationship he has with <clears throat> We were intended to walk with God, to have conversations with him, and to have him involved in our life. He was meant to provide for us. I mean, life was meant to be. It's like, oh, you're hungry. Well, go grab it. It wasn't a matter of, oh, well, I've got to rely on a farmer to grow this and fertilize it and, and take care of it and then go and gather it. 
And now I'm providing for it because I went and worked my job so I can pay for that app. We've kind of made things complex and, and I recognize that's kind of the way things are and it's the world we live in. So that's what we gotta <laughs> do, but it was never meant to be that way. It was meant to be simple. Are you hungry? Go grab an apple. Are you are you hungry for the presence of God? Go talk to him. That's what it's supposed to look like. That's what it was always meant to be. And what Jesus is telling us right here is that it still can be. There's nothing keeping us from that except ourselves. <clears throat> So we've got to be willing to just break this thing open because there's no other way we're going to learn about who God is. We can get other people's opinions, but it's secondhand Jesus. And I don't care how good the preacher is. I don't care how, I don't care if he walks in the room and, it, and he glows. Okay? I don't care. It doesn't matter because it's still secondhand Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember hearing from a preacher named Francis Chan, and, and he, his mentor um, had told him that he just gets so frustrated with us here in the United States because what we do is we get hooked on these pastors, whether it's Charles Stanley, Chuck Swindoll, or, or Louis Giglio, or I don't know, any number of, whoever it is that you really love to listen to, if that's what you enjoy doing. <laughs> They're good, they're fine, fine listening, that, no problem with that. But the problem is that's where we stop. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'd love to go meet this guy. I'd love to go sit under his teaching. What, what, his, what his mentor said is that we get so caught up in going and taking in motions that he doesn't realize, that we, that we don't realize, that we can go all the way up the mountain and talk to God. And that's the way it's meant to be. We're meant to be in a relationship with God. Always. Every day. All day. That's what he wants for us. And it takes this to do it. And it changes us because we see who he is. And suddenly we're like, that makes sense. Life is better if I do it this way. Life's better for me, life's better for my family, life's better for my friends, it's better for my coworkers, it's better for that stranger I just met and I will probably never see again. But she's gonna jump in. But it's this this endless quest for Jesus. That's really what it comes down to. And what I've learned is that life is empty unless we've got something bigger than ourselves to live for. Because if all it is is go to work, earn some money, come home, buy food, eat it, and pay the rent, you're just spending your day like that every day. And you're just hoping to build up enough to where when you die, you can have enough to have Uncle Sam tax the heck out of it but when you pass it on to your kids. <laughs> and if that's all there is, well then you know what? You've only done something that lasts a couple generations. I want more for, out of my life than that. I want more out of your life than that. I, I want to hear stories in heaven about your not just your grandchildren, but your great great grandchildren. How they may not have ever gotten to meet you, but they knew about what effect you had because they're hearing from their grandparents about what they learned from their grandparents, which is you. <clears throat> and you know, if you don't have kids, it still doesn't change things because you can still pour into people around you and they can hear, and their kids. And their grandkids can hear stories about you and how you poured into them. We may not have physical kids, but we still can have spiritual kids. Again, it's not going to matter anything unless Jesus 
is woven through every day of life. All of it. Can I get like heavy on that feeling? Like if I'm not loving good enough or, or being gracious or listening enough, uh, I just think about Luke 17 where he says, it's inevitable for stumbling blocks, but woe to him who this stumbling comes through. And I was like, maybe that's as much as I can do for that day is just not be a stumbling block for someone else. Like I might not have something for my great grandkids, my all of my ancestors, but I can definitely not be a stumbling block that day when it's a hard day. No, I mean that that I mean the way you put it is like on my bad days, the best I can afford is not screw something. Else. And I get that. It feels that way, but you know what? That's more profound pain than you think. Because honestly, again, going back to the illustration of, of parenthood, <clears throat> you know, honestly, the biggest thing that we have, well, not the biggest thing, but one of the main things that we hope for as parents is to not traumatize our children. <laughs> and yet, that's just cold hard truth. <laughs> 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 I learned when I have a bad day and things get crazy, I just like, Take a breath and relax. Okay, this is just not the plan I was supposed to take. I didn't to take out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that helps well, a lot. Start your day. Yeah. Can't listen to ourselves. We're living with That's a good point. <laughs> so, I really just wanted to take this time to encourage you guys. Um, the Bible is such a a beautiful and wonderful thing. It, it, it is God's gift to us, but not for its own sake. It, it, it's for our sake to connect us to him, teach us who he is. And if we're not getting that out of it, we're not getting the point. <clears throat> so I really just want to challenge you guys this week. Pick a book. I mean, I, I've gotten, I'll be the first to admit that there are times I flip open and I'm like, okay, today I'm in Jeremiah 16, and I got something out of that. But you know, usually when you jump into the middle of a Bible book, <clears throat> you get almost nothing out of it. There, there's exceptions for sure. But I just want to encourage you this week, pick a book of the Bible and go after it. more you read it, the more you're going to get out of it. So, you know, like um, I, I had somebody who taught me how to study the Bible years ago, and one of his challenges was, he said, I want you to read the book of Esther every day this week. And that sounds like, why would I want to read the same book seven times? You know, it doesn't take very long. It's like a 20 to 30 minute read, depending on how fast you read. But it, it's basically just read this book. And then you know what? At the end of that week, I understood the book of Esther like I never had. The people weren't just, okay, it's Haman guys, the bad guy. I got that part. Okay, now um, go through the rest of it. People start to become, the characters start to become people. You start to understand what's going on, what God's doing. And the interesting part is that Esther is the one book of the Bible that never mentions God. And you can see God woven through the whole story, even though he's never mentioned. But if all you do is just skim it, it's out. And so that, that's all my challenge to you. Not so much Esther. I mean, you can pick Esther if that's what you want. That's great. Maybe it'll be First John. Maybe it'll be Genesis. I don't know. But spend as much time reading a block of it as you can if it's one of the bigger books. Because when you read for five minutes here or 15 minutes there, you break it up into pieces in our mind. It's hard to put those pieces back together. If you can, if you can <clears> sit <throat> down and read a whole book like Esther or First John um, in one sitting, then I encourage you to do it. It helps so much. Uh, and then again, repeatedly reading it. So day after day after day, you just get this better picture. Every day you get clearer understanding of what it's about, of how you see God in so I just want to challenge you again, just open it up, pick a spot, and go after it. But go after it with everything you got. Don't just check it off your lips. Because God doesn't work that way. God, God doesn't say, okay, if you pour a minimal amount of effort into it, I'll give you the riches of eternity. 
Who wants our hearts? To pour your heart into them. What's that? I can go on. Go ahead and cut it off there. So I just want to, again, that's my challenge. Pick a book and go after it. Let's pray. Father God, I come to you and I'm just so grateful that you are a God who loves us so much that you you don't just ask us to come spend a little time with you here and there. It's, it's, it's not about quality time. It's about all the time. It's about having a real relationship with us that that we feel free sharing with you what's going on, all, all the the weird thoughts that go through our heads. <coughs> All, all the the things that we're too ashamed to talk about, everything. You know it anyway, so it's just a matter of us sharing it, what's going on. And then it draws into your presence so that we can go to the Bible and we can see you woven throughout it. So we can, we can come to understand who you are a little more clearly. So that we can more clearly reflect Jesus to the people around us. So that maybe they'll look at us and they'll say, wow, maybe there's something to this God thing. I think I'll go check it out because <clears throat> this person is different. God, I want to be different. I want to be weird, but I want to be weird like Jesus is. I don't want to fit in. I don't want to be normal. I don't want to fade into the background. I, I want to have an extraordinary and eternal life that has eternal fruit. He told us if we just remain in you, we would bear fruit. So help us. We need your help in even that. All we can do is let God help us to lean on you. <clears throat> We need you all the way, every moment. I thank you so much for your goodness, how you help us every step of the way. <clears throat> In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.